Hello and welcome to the next episode, podcast 10 of the Motor Doc podcast. Um, We've been discussing uh, the energy and emissions impact of maintenance decisions, basically, and the reliability and maintenance and the potential KPI of using, uh, you know, the energy associated with defects. Now, This will be the last one we do for a couple of episodes on electrical signature analysis while we're working on the other study having to do with uh, vibration and ESA and energy. Uh, We will talk about that a little bit more, uh, just a little bit, because the actual conclusions are going to be used in a series of papers in 2024. But um, here we're going to talk quickly about, as I discussed in the last podcast, about several uh, field projects we did uh, over the last month and what the conclusions were uh, overall. We're not gonna mention the companies. Uh, We're just gonna say that they both had uh, excellent maintenance practices in place, meaning that we didn't find significant issues. We found average, um, you know, conditions such as soft foot misalignment and greasing. That's the most common. We didn't really find bad bearings, for instance. We didn't find uh, other significant problems. Uh, The first one involves 53 uh, motors. Now, with the 53 motors that ranged from about a half horsepower all the way up to over 2,500 horsepower, um, 36 machines, we were able to get both voltage and current. So we were able to get energy data on just those machines. There were several that were much larger as well as part of this project, but they only had uh, current available. They were 4160 volt and 2300 volt uh, electric motors uh, that um, we did not have access to PT data. So the very, very old systems in which they had just a display, one phase of current. We were still able to analyze and identify the problems, but we weren't able to associate the energy aspect with it. So with just that in mind, uh, but we still had the full range of machines from half to over 2,500 horsepower due to some soft foot alignment and basic lubrication for the smaller motors and some looseness, meaning some oversized Uh, bearings in the sleeve bearing motors, we came up with roughly uh, 367.2 kilowatts demand um, and that resulted in 728,000 or uh, yeah almost 729,000 kilowatt hours of usage and uh, I'm sorry that uh, yeah and um, 518 metric tons of CO2. Now this here is actually probably should be a third, uh, but um, this uh, we put it we calculated everything as two thousand hours and the site was actually six thousand hours, so that should be a hundred and twenty, um, hundred and twenty six ish um, kilowatts. So pardon pardon my error uh, with that. Uh, but this, this, these two are still correct. So 728,790 kilowatt hours and 518 metric tons of CO2 just for those conditions. And let me show you a rough idea. So uh, these were some of them. These were larger machines here. Uh, and this included um, this one here in which we identified turbulence in uh, air. So this is, these were actually blowers. Uh, so they, they had some turbulence there that, uh, that added up uh, and this was, it was 6.3 kilowatts demand, should have stayed 6.3 here. Let's get rid of that. And um, this means that 37,200 kilowatt hours and 26.4 tons of CO2 from that machine. Now we start down, we look at some of these other ones, misalignment and soft foot. Uh, and then um, also uh, turbulence again, and we see 68,400 because of the size of the machine and 48.3 metric tons possible in that machine. So you can see that these all add up pretty quick and all of the conditions found 
were primarily correctable conditions. Precision alignment would definitely knock that down. Um, stator mechanical means something moving in the stator. That, that's a little more severe. But uh, the bearings themselves, this, in this case here, this one here, line 13, that's a sleeve bearing. And the total losses associated with all of that was 8.1. This was an excellent operating facility. So can you imagine if the facility wasn't operating so well? So um, that was the first site. So not too bad and uh, really simply simple correctable systems. Um, we're going to get a chance to take a look at conditions after the corrections are made. Next one, um, a smaller sample and this happened uh, recently where we just went in a couple of 200 horsepower machines. Um, they were all across the line. The previous one, all on VFDs, all operating, whatever the point was, so that the values we used were conservative. This one here, cross the line, start up, run, uh, just pumps. And um, we ended up with a total of about four kilowatts demand uh, that came out to at 6, 000, or 8,000 hours, 31,760 kilowatt hours and a total of potentially 19.5 tons, metric tons of CO2. That's conservative values. ESA allowed us to do all of this very, very quickly um, using our kilowatt uh, spectra. So we basically just found the faults in the kilowatts at that point. Now we know that the mo machines aren't going to be operating anymore, so this is probably pretty accurate because they were right at full load. So that was uh, motors. Uh, what else did we do? Now this will be a short, relatively short uh, presentation today because it's conclusions. Uh, next week we're going to start covering compressed air systems and steam and all kinds of stuff, starting with an overview of the uh, of my dissertation um, from 1999. But in any case, another opportunity came up, and that had to do with transformers. So this is a si overall site um, location. This here is just a measurement, one of the measurement locations of ground. You can see all the ground leads there. Uh, this uh, opportunity, oh, sorry, grab the wrong one. There we go. Get this open. This opportunity here, and we will show partial. Um, when we took a look at it, uh, we found conditions such as okay, so that is at um, about five amps. That's a, that's that's a single um, circuit breaker. And this is 180 hertz pure, by the way, uh, pure 180 hertz on neutral. Have never seen that before. Uh, that was a first. Let me go ahead and um, show, I, in particular, I want to show the ground. So we went ahead and we put in some Onyx devices uh, to see what, um, what was going on. And uh, yeah, that was the main. Here's the one. This is ground uh, at the main transformer. And you can see the value here is just over 30 amps. Uh, we went ahead and put uh, our, uh, our um, uh, the filters, whoops, sorry. Put the filters directly uh, on, the, um, uh, on the ground system. And the end result, with the exact same conditions, was, um, you know, usually being a little better prepared is a good idea, right? Let's pause for a second. Okay, so and here we go. And this is what the waveform looked like 
after getting that. Now you can see it's come down a long ways, but we're back to 60 hertz uh, and under 25 amps. This did have an impact. We saw an immediate drop. Uh, we're still waiting to see what happens next with saturation uh, of the um, of the Onyx devices. Uh, but there, there was a very definitive drop. Now this is a constant load location. That's actually a data center, um, which is why I'm being a little cautious of moving stuff into the screen there. But in any case, um, let's see. And then um, uh, this is next one is the result of yet in that same location while we're hunting for Sasquatch. Um, this was an area where we ended up watching uh, some um, CTs actually melt uh, in, in the transformers. So temperature here, uh, more or less, and, and you can see that there's hotter spots within the uh, transformer, uh, definitely uh, exceeded the operating temperature of the CTs. So that most likely contributed to it. Uh, let's take a look and see how we identified it. First one is here. Huh. Okay, well we'll we'll go ahead and we will um, leave this one out. Sorry about that. And don't mind the muskrat. <laughs> oh, there it is. Ah, there we go. So um, here's the one we were looking for. So this, this, this is an ability so I can look at data um, while the uh, monitoring system is still in place. But this is what called our attention to the problem right away and you can see it's you know extremely obvious they either single phased their their transformer uh, or they had some other issue we found interesting um, was uh, this down here so let's go ahead and we're gonna back this up so we can sharpen up the peaks we can go in here and see that twice line frequency at 120 kilohertz. So this, this little issue um, was generating a little bit, but more so what we were concerned about was this. Now these are 2,500 KVA transformers. Whoop, so Obviously, we're not going to see it here, so we'll we'll skip that. The reason this uh, this was bumping back and forth is because it's um, going in and checking to see if there's any to, anything to monitor. Uh, the CTs are disconnected, and the transformers are being repaired. So uh, we can get out of this, and let's go ahead over to. Okay, there we go. The next one. So this one is. Uh, the one right beside it that looks similar and it has not had that problem yet. There we go and you can see um, that the waveform is much different. This is what we would expect to see. Little dimples here uh, that is harmonic content. We'll take a look at that as well. It's not significant um, but let's go ahead and um, see what this looks like down here. You can see there's a lot of little bumps. This is going to be more along the lines of the losses associated with the harmonic content. You can see 60 kilowatts and so on. Um, get it to go back. All this is being done via um, there we go. Gotta love cell modems. So let's get down here. There's some kind of higher frequency thing going on up there. But let's take a look and see what's going on. And you can see that we've got um, 
multiple spots here. So that, that's the harmonic losses associated with the transformer. So we could add those together basically and come up with an idea. So it's 120, that's twice that, it's three times that, and so on. Um, and so we're, we're going to say, uh, we'll estimate that at, um, say, about 120, maybe 130 kilowatts at first glance. So what's going on there? Well, primarily in addition to a little bit of harmonic content, um, which we will see in a second. You can see here our current harmonics are you know, at third harmonic at about 10% and then they drop off quickly. Makes sense, it's another data center, so um, we've got some stuff going on there. And voltage harmonics are relatively low, but still exceed the recommended value for that type of transformer. Plus we have some even harmonics. All the even harmonics usually come with something that's overloaded. And there we go, 2500 kVA is operating at 3000 kVA, so it's got a bit of a load to it. Um, so 3020 3, kVA is, is definitely overloaded. Total current draw is significant and so on. So um, in this case, uh, this is an opportunity. Um, we are working with the, uh, with the owner on getting those loads down uh, and figuring out uh, other ways to unload uh, that problem, in particular dealing with similar harmonic content as we saw in that first, uh, uh, on the other one, the pure 180 hertz on, on uh, the uh, ground system, uh, I'm sorry, neutral and ground, um, while 60 hertz on the primary, and that's a really, really unusual. I mean, no sign of 60, just straight 120. So in the end, um, we have a number of opportunities there. And uh, we will talk about those more at another time. Next week, we're going to start into compressed air. That's an easy one. And then we'll follow that with steam systems. I'm pulling up some old, old data that we did as part of the Save Energy Now program uh, to go into what we found with that. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So I figured we'd have a little fun, and uh, I went ahead and had a chat with, well, ChatGPT. Seeing as they've now released uh, certain capabilities, including full access to the internet, which has been interesting. Uh, I, d I asked it to write a blog for me uh, about, uh, you know, in my voice, referencing articles that, that I have published on academia.edu. Um, and, uh, I think it was particularly interesting because it cited me in uh, names of articles that I had to go search. I said, how on earth did this happen? And sure enough, in pure fashion, uh, it had hallucinated the names of those articles uh, and uh, I had never said any such thing. <laughs> so, so in any case, I asked it to do two things. Um, I asked it to automatically write me uh, two pieces meant for blogs and I was going to include these today so we've got some time and in pure happy Thanksgiving spirit so happy Thanksgiving um, we will go ahead and present these two turkeys um, they're not horrible they're just interesting so the first one it titled the hilarious intersection of reliability maintenance and the quest for energy efficiency uh, as the title uh, in the high-stakes comedy of corporate energy and emissions goals, reliability and maintenance play the straight man. These seemingly mundane practices are actually the unsung heroes in the laugh riot that is the quest for energy efficiency in commercial and industrial companies. The paper, this paper explores the comedic gold that unfolds when reliability and maintenance routines join forces with corporate energy and emissions strategies. Huh. Uh, so in the introduction, imagine a world where machines run with the precision of a Swiss watch and the grace of a gazelle in a tutu. Welcome to the utopia of reliability and maintenance in the industrial realm. But wait, there's a plot twist. These practices are not just about avoiding the mechanical equivalent of a pratfall. 
They're integral to the slapstick routine of meeting energy and emissions goals. And like any good comedy duo, when they work together, the results can be side-splittingly effective. Not clear on why the, the chat GPT felt like relating uh, reliability, maintenance, energy, and, uh, and, uh, and emissions as a comedy, or in particular, corporate energy and emissions goals being some kind of comedy, but we'll, we'll pass that for now. So the punchline of preventive maintenance. Preventive maintenance is like the opening act that warms up the crowd. By regular, regularly servicing equipment, companies ensure that machines are not just running, but running efficiently. A well-oiled machine doesn't just prevent a mechanical face plant, or electrical, I guess, and, and they didn't say that. I guess it's stuck in the mechanical realm, but okay, I can see the comedy there. It also uses less energy, like a marathon runner who doesn't sweat. This is the kind of energy efficiency that makes Mother Nature and accountants chuckle with glee. Okay, and then um, then it goes on for predictive maintenance, the comedic timing of industry. The crystal ball of the maintenance world, predictive maintenance, tells us when a machine is about to deliver its punchline, ideally before it actually breaks down. Okay, that's true. By using sensors and analytics, companies can predict and prevent equipment failures. This is the equivalent of delivering the joke at just the right moment. It saves energy, reduces emissions, and keeps the audience, aka the production line, from groaning. Of course, they left out the fact, the, the uh, paper it wrote left out the fact that human beings should be doing inspections and, and, uh, and other activities associated with predictive maintenance. But it is AI and it wants to promote itself, you know, just like any, well, thank goodness, not sentient being. But I digress. Reliability. The straight man in the energy efficiency comedy act. Okay, reliability might not wear a funny hat. I don't know, I've seen some, have you met a reliability engineer? Well, neither here nor there. But it sets up the jokes for others to knock out of the park. When equipment is reliable, it runs at peak performance, sipping energy like a fine wine, rather than guzzling, guzzling it like a frat boy at a keg party. Reliable operations mean fewer emissions as machines aren't constantly being pushed to their slapstick limits. The Encore, integrating reliability and maintenance into corporate goals. To close the show with a standing ovation, Companies must integrate reliability and maintenance into their energy and emissions strategies. This involves setting up the stage with the right metrics, ensuring that every act in the production process is aiming for the same comedic climax, a reduction in energy use and emissions. When done right, the result is a performance that even the toughest critics, regulators, customers, investors will applaud. Okay. And then we get to, thank goodness, the conclusion. In conclusion, reliability and maintenance are the laurel and hardy <laughs> of the corporate energy world. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just picturing that right now. Um, I, I think I've met them at some locations, but luckily not my customers. Uh, when they work in comedic harmony, they not only keep the lights on, the machines humming, but do so in a way that tickles the funny bone of energy efficiencies and emissions reductions. It's a performance that deserves standing ovation, mostly because it's done while balancing on a tightrope over a pool of environmental regulations and market pressures. So let's give it up for the unsung comedians in the corporate of the corporate world. May their routines continue to get laughs and save the planet one giggle watt at a time. Giggle watt at a time. Good God. So in any case, I'm, I'm sorry. I am just thinking about the Stooges at this point. I know it said Laurel and Hardy, but but I've been to some locations before where I can just, yeah. In any case, um, let's get on to a slightly different approach. I went ahead and told it, hey, can you do me a favor? That really sucked. 
So um, let's go ahead and see if you can do one in the voice of a CEO. So this one is a different approach. So it, the title right away is, is a little more serious. Integration of Reliability and Maintenance in Corporate Energy and Emission Strategies. Now, if I'm assuming you're like me and that sounds a little more serious, right? So abstract, this technical document outlines the imperative role of reliability and maintenance, the advancement of corporate energy efficiency and emissions reduction goals. Already big words. Okay, it delineates the mechanisms through which optimized maintenance strategies contribute to sustainable operations in commercial and industrial companies, ensuring that energy and emissions metrics are not only, not only met, but continuously improved upon. And one of my problems with this, by the way, is I'm reading papers like this now, which tells me a lot of the people writing stuff in our industry, or a handful, I should say, um, for their blog posts and stuff um, are, are not actually probably themselves writing it. But let's, I digress again. So introduction, the contemporary commercial and industrial landscape is increasingly influenced by the need to reduce energy consumption and minimize greenhouse gas emissions. As companies strive to meet stringent environmental standards and corporate sustainability objectives, the integration of reliability and maintenance to energy and emissions frameworks becomes critical. This integration serves as a cornerstone for operational efficiency and environmental stewardship. And did that paragraph actually say anything? Nope, it is ChatGPT. So therefore, it just used words. So uh, next one, reliability, its impact on energy efficiency. Let's see where it went here. Reliability is an in an industrial context refers to the ability of systems and components to perform their required functions under stated conditions for a specified period. By the way, it's a great summary of the purpose of RCM, as a matter of fact, so fantastic. Uh, high reliability levels are indicative of an indicative or whatever, of well-maintained equipment operating at optimal performance, which is intrinsically linked to energy efficiency. This is a true statement, by the way. Reliable operations minimize the occurrence of unscheduled downtime and reduce the incidence of energy wastage, wastage? due to equipment malfunction or suboptimal performance. Okay, that's a good statement. Uh, that says a little bit more. So maintenance strategies and emissions reduction. So pre preventive and predictive maintenance strategies are pivotal in curtailing emissions. Regular maintenance ensures that equipment operates within designated parameters, thereby preventing excess energy consumption and associated emissions. Good job. Uh, predictive maintenance leveraging advanced diagnostics and analytics can forecast potential failures and inefficiencies, allowing for preemptive measures that conserve energy and reduce the carbon footprint. Wow, that is actually an improvement. Okay, good, good. If I'd asked ChatGPT to write this a month ago, which I did, by the way, it would not have been this uh, pretty. Metrics for energy and emissions performance. To quantify the impact of reliability and maintenance on energy and emissions, it is imperative to establish preci precise metrics. Key performance indicators, such as mean time between failures, okay, overall equipment effectiveness, ah, I must be sneaking and looking at SMRP, right, and energy intensity, there we go, that's a, that's a good metric that we don't actually approach and I hadn't even thought of. So that is an excellent one because I'm doing a project related to evaluating energy and intensity as part of a, an energy improvement program right now. So hadn't thought of that as the actual, actual metric. So good, interesting. Offer insights into the effect, you know that's gonna be in my next newsletter. Uh, offer insights into the effectiveness of maintenance programs in relation to energy and emissions goals. These metrics facilitate data-driven decisions and continuous improvements. Well, we did learn something out of that, and whether that is an, a real, well, energy intensity I've seen, but I've not seen it as a KPI. So um, very, very, very interesting idea. And I think that's actually how I use ChatGPT and some of these AIs is to generate, you know, something different. Uh, 
um, from uh, from when I'm looking at stuff. And by the way, all I did was say write an article about this topic. Um, it's it's definitely come a long way. Uh, you know, the, with with all the stuff going on with Sam Altman this week, that that uh, I, I expect things to get even more exciting because um, uh, the yeah. The, the story behind that has been interesting. I've been following it. Case study, oh, okay, back to, the, back to the article. Case studies and best practices. Empirical evidence from commercial and industrial sectors illustrates the efficacy of integrating reliability and maintenance uh, in achieving energy and emissions targets. Best practices include the implementation of energy management systems such as ISO 50001 which is well adopted elsewhere in the world, but not really in the United States, just something to keep in mind, which incorporates maintenance strategies into broader energy management practices. 50001, which is also recommended by the Department of Energy, by the way, is a framework for energy efficient operations of plants. So um, in conclusion, the synergy between reliability, maintenance, and corporate energy and emissions objectives is undeniable, as I've been stating my whole career, but that's neither here nor there. Commercial and industrial uh, companies that adopt a holistic approach to integrating these elements not only elevate their operational efficiency, but also demonstrate environmental responsibility. It is incumbent upon corporate leadership to champion these initiatives, fostering a culture of sustainability that permeates every level of the organization. Oh, and they left out one key point though. They, they, they really do focus on the stewardship and so on. But in reality, the reduction in energy alone, I mean, the nice thing is to couple that with the, the, the climate portion or the emissions portion, which also includes just pollution reduction. But really, the reduction in energy reduces the overall cost to produce a product or maintain a facility, whatever. Um, and that, that has a direct impact on profitability. Now, if you want to change the view of the reliability and maintenance organization at your location, what you do is you start looking at something that improves the profitability, which changes the view of maintenance and reliability as an expense to a way of making improvements. Just like Elihu Goldrat did with, with the theory of constraints. He hit areas that they saw as expense, like uh, inventories and stuff like that, and said, here's how we can fix it. The one objection I had, it, because of his biggest statement, and, and everybody kind of avoids that, And I, other than the fact that, that we saw the holes in that whole theory of constraints through 2020 and, and right after, but um, was his direct statement was that if you're telling me you're reducing the cost of operations, show me the number of heads you've removed, meaning how many people you've reduced. Not an area that I, I condone. Uh, I always look to see how people can be better utilized because if they weren't useful, they wouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, we'll talk about that another time, probably in an interview uh, with somebody. Uh, anyways, recommendations. There is one last piece here. To harness the full potential of reliability and maintenance and energy and emissions management, it is recommended that companies invest in advanced predictive maintenance technologies. I'm assuming it's kind of pushing towards machine learning and AI, but I would like to think, you know, empath and ESA, right? <laughs> Um, train and empower staff in reliability center maintenance practices. Okay, um, I get what it's saying. Uh, I, I think the term would be better to say advanced maintenance practice because reliability centered maintenance is not a maintenance strategy. It is a methodology to develop your maintenance. Uh, but that's that's something else. Regularly review and update maintenance procedures to align with evolving energy and emission standards. That can be built into your RCM program uh, and also uh, uh, any, uh, any maintenance optimization program. I mean, think about it. Um, when, when do you replace filters uh, if you're looking at uh, pressure drop 
uh, in say a fan house, right? Um, you would replace it when it hits a certain point. But what if you also measured the energy consumption associated with it and gave yourself a gap and said, we can, we can accept this much energy consumption and therefore we'll set it here instead of people trying to come up with cleanliness standards, uh, come up with the air restriction. You know, because when you started consuming that much more energy, you're not actually effectively producing uh, airflow, right? That's an example. Uh, now, next, uh, establish clear KPIs to monitor and report on the intersection of maintenance activities with the energy and emissions performance. I'm going to return to that in a minute. Engage in continuous improvement programs to promote energy conservation and emissions reductions as core business values. This alignment not only serves immediate operational goals, but also positions the company as a forward-thinking entity committed to sustainable practices and responsible resource management. Actually, what it really does is it establishes the company as somebody who wants to make a profit. If you allow things to run down, you spend more money than what you think you're saving. Um, if you watch the first half of this uh, of this podcast you would have noted that the values there and that was in those were in good operate i mean they were nice plants i wasn't expecting to find much of anything but slight misalignment i mean it wasn't severe it weren't killing the bearings yet but uh they would eventually because part of the losses we found with that wasn't just um the misalignment but it was also stresses on the bearings because I count that. So when I look and I say, okay, it's slightly misaligned. Here's the energy associated with that. What's the loss? What are the losses across the components of the bearings? Um, and, and add those in, which may also be lubrication, but primarily are going to show up, especially on the drive end bearing. So in any case, going back to this, establish clear KPIs. Now, um, and by the way, the, these were first drafts. These, these I did not go in and ask it to, to modify them at all or, or meet anything in particular I wanted. Um, that's just straight. Just asked it in one sentence, write me an article about this. Um, and uh, it thought it would be funny in the first attempt. And so I asked it the same question and I said, but do it as a CEO. <laughs> and that was the second one. Very, very similar results. But when I start looking at it and I say, okay, it's recommended some stuff with KPI, but you can literally take measurements, uh, you know, as part of your maintenance process. I mean, if you are doing alignment, say, and this is part of what, what we've been doing, because I, I have a number of cases where we go in and we do, you know, the readings before, and then you do the alignment. Uh, and then you take the readings after and you see the change in energy between those two points. That is a measurable value. And what do we want uh, in any maintenance reliability program? You know, I, I keep hearing the term, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Well, we can measure this. And uh, as we move forward past this, past electrical signature analysis starting next week, we start looking at compressed air and steam and some of the other stuff. Uh, you're going to see that there's a lot of ways to measure these as direct measurable values, not estimations. And if you saw my rant in my last newsletter, you'll know that um, I'm not talking about making numbers up. Uh, again, you know, one of my pet peeves was one where, where I went in and this, um, you know, IoT device company, you know, AI and all this other stuff said, oh, we detected this. This is how much energy. And it was a vibration related company. And I looked at it and I said, really? Yeah. Well, you know that you're telling me that that is using like 110 horsepower, but it's only a 75 horsepower motor. And no, the motor wasn't overloaded. So um, it was you know, it's something that disturbs me when it comes to that. I, I'd rather have a value that I can actually measure. Like when I'm taking the data with, with uh, the system that I'm using, the Empath, um, you know, the, the cool part was, was getting the kilowatt portion put in so we could take a look and see what the defect, what was the air gap loss? Because those values are actual air gap loss 
calculated through, you know, the the actual air gap torque, um, and that all stems back to work done by the Department of Energy because Empath is started as a as an Oak Ridge National Labs product. So um, it, it it just ah. So when we go through some of this other stuff, we're going to talk about you know measuring our losses as accurately as possible using real science instead of made up numbers and and part of the reason why I'm doing this other study uh, relating the vibration values uh, to um, to everything else and, and we've made improvements in the software since I did number nine where I did the demo of the thing so now I can get inches per second uh, as well as my uh, acceleration um, decided not to do displacement uh, but I can use either I can use in particular inches per second for my lower frequency uh, area in order to take a look and calculate what the vibrational losses are and then we can do that in relation to the measured kilowatts air gap kilowatts which are going to be more accurate um, so uh, if down the road I'm able to take it and say okay here are the, the here's the measurement in um, in vibration and here's the stiffness then and and I can take some of those mechanical losses and calculate an actual value that's measurable in kilowatts um, then um, then that's going to be a big leap I have not been able to find uh, any papers related to that yet as a matter of fact if you know of any I would like to see them because I want to make sure I reference them but they have to be real I mean people making stuff up is is not something that I want to do to deal with um, it's causing problems in the industry uh, and and that's going to be another subject for another day well kind of but um, but basically when a, a, you know my biggest pet peeve I think in the past couple of years is everybody's leaping on board because they can take a laptop in a kitchen or in a basement and develop an IOT technology and they've read an article or they found a textbook or <laughs> more likely in the last year um, they they you know they're using chat GPT and the information coming off of it now I use um, the different versions of what they're now calling copilot uh, I've used those for roughly a year now it's getting that time right almost a year since it's a uh, official release but GitHub and these other areas where you do programming, <clears throat> I've used those tools uh, to streamline programming, uh, whether it's in MATLAB or or C plus plus or C sharp or um, you know more likely Python these days. I use I do a lot of data science now, so that's a thing. Uh, it shortcuts a lot of the stuff that's bothersome, but because I've been doing that type of work since I was a teenager. Um, you know, way, way, way back when Apple II's first came out, um, before the Macs, right? Uh, all the way up to now, um, I, I look at it and having that experience and understanding of basic programming allows me to identify when it's telling me something that's not right or when it's doing something that's not right, which is relatively often. Uh, when I put something out there, I don't just cut and paste from ChatGPT into whatever. Especially if I'm passing, you know, a hundred lines of code, um, you have to know what it's doing. Otherwise, you're going to get wrong answers every single time. And unfortunately, that's what we see in the field. Um, and then the idea that that eliminating personnel. This was a discussion we had recently. Um, you know, around the the IEEE standards group I sat in a week ago? Yeah. Um, two weeks ago. In any case, the, um, the problem was that, you know, two-thirds of what we put into standards is how to do the visual inspection. And there are no technologies that are capable at this point in time of doing that. And people are, oh, yeah, machine learning and AI. But if you've been involved in programming or doing machine learning and AI, you would know that you need to have 
many, many, many examples. I mean, face recognition comes from millions upon millions of data sets, meaning millions of millions of pictures going in and identification going on. So, you know, going in and saying, oh yeah, I've got um, three sets of what this problem looks like. I'm gonna toss that into a machine learning system. It's gonna tell me whatever. And no, 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 you need to have, um, you know, uh, you need to have basically data sets measuring in the six, seven, eight digits in order to do that. Uh, I had recently somebody asked me, well, how many millions of data sets did you use to come up with, you know, your algorithms and empath? Well, uh, no, that's not how that worked at all. I mean, empath is not a machine learning system. It's an expert system, meaning that we know what the values are based upon the same thing we knew what vibration analysis was before and it didn't take millions of data it took simple physics um, that's why the system that i came up with and published in ieee uh, in 2020 and 2021 was so important in that it covered um, the hybrid approach to that and and i had published something similar uh, some years earlier uh, and, and that's actually what had got me into another project, but in which we looked at, um, you know, how do you blend these things together? And that was on predictive life of machines. And uh, that came out to be extremely accurate. Now people are trying to do the same thing with straight AI, machine learning, I'm sorry. This is the other ridiculous thing. Marketing refers to it as AI, it's machine learning, sorry. Um, when, uh, when they came up with these variations of machine learning to do, um, to do that, uh, none of them have been accurate. They, they didn't understand, uh, it, the, the technology doesn't understand and the people setting up the programs are not in the industry and, and don't know how to do the little tweaks necessary. Um, you know, one of the things that's true about this is bias. And this is one of my rants, by the way, normally I'd have this on paper, but it's called bias and, and that bias exists. So you've got programmers bias in any type of program, whether it's a straight program, machine learning, AI, whatever. And, um, you know, I, being aware of that, you can actually build your bias in. I mean, that's how we got the accuracy on the one project I did. We went in and was like, okay, machine learning wants to say this. Well, machine learning's wrong. That's not what that says. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to say this when we see this. And you go in and you make sure you program it so it sets it in that right direction. Um, that happens already. That's already happening, but it's happening with people that don't know the topic uh, very well. And, and I still go back to, would you want a rotating machinery specialist that wore a tie. So um, with that, uh, I will, I'm will. i gonna end this because I think I've hit my hour now. <laughs> so uh, enjoy the two-part series for podcast number 10 uh, and the extra rant at the end. Um, thought I'd toss in a little bit of machine learning for fun, uh, but as I said, energy intensity, it's something I'm working on right now. So. Um, I, I think I'm going to take a look at that and see how that could be looked at as a KPI um, for operations or maintenance, uh, let alone energy consumption and emissions. So with that, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and thank you for tolerating my rant. Have a good day. And by the way, happy Thanksgiving for those in the U.S.